Welcome, Junior Takis. My name is Mrs. Ramlal, and I will be preparing you for Grade 12 Life Science exam prep for Paper 1. Life Science this year is a bit different. The format of the paper has changed. So I'd like to first go over the exam paper with you, the format of the paper, the different the breakdown, and then we'll go on to your skills that you might need. Now, as we look on the screen, paper one topics. Paper one has a lot of topics, and I see that you're writing on the 19th of November. There's still a lot of time after your holiday. But let's look at the topics. The first topic is reproduction in vertebrates. And if you look, let's look at the marks. Eight marks. Now, I know some of you are thinking, it's only eight marks, let me leave it for last. But what in case the examiner decides to join two questions together? So my advice is don't do something like that. Don't leave out questions or sections that have little marks. Human reproduction, 41 marks. And today I will be going over a lot of tips and clues and ideas and notes that you must know and information you must know to help you get 41 marks. Then, responding to environment, 54 marks. This is the nervous system, the eye, and the ear. Whoa, I know you're thinking, eye and ear? No, I've got some good tips for you. Responding to environment, plants, 13 marks. Yes, I know you don't like plants from grade 10, but again, stick with me. I'll make it easy. I'll tell you exactly what to concentrate on so you can get those 13 marks. And then lastly, the endocrine and the homeos and homeostasis in humans. This is a section that is linked. So don't learn the sections in isolation. 34 marks. So if you look at the breakdown, a lot of sections to study, 150 marks. And today, what I want you to do is join me, stick for this hour, and I will help you get 120 out of 150. Okay, all right, let's move on to the breakdown of this new exam paper. In the last year, there used to be an essay. You guys are lucky, there is no essay anymore. There's only section A, which is 50 marks. Section B, two questions, 50 marks each. Now, let's look at section A. They're going to give you multiple choice, terminology, your matching, 50 marks. Now, Junior Takis. This is going to be the easiest 50 marks. Make sure when you are writing this paper, you do well, you concentrate, you read this questions carefully. It's going to be easy 50 marks. Now, most of you are thinking, the essay is not there, I'm going to do well. These examiners are smart. They've taken now uh, the essay questions and they can make them long, difficult questions. So, question B is a variety of questions. Looking at our prelims, there's going to be case studies, there's going to be scientific experiments, practical questions. So we will go over some of the questions as well, the different types of questions, and I will teach you the skills that you need to know. For life science, paper one and two, you must know skills. If you want to do well, you need to prepare well for your skills. So this is the breakdown of the paper. You are the first ones that are going to write this exam with the new breakdown. So we will, you will be the first guinea pigs. Right, let's move on to... A very important tip. Please, when you are preparing for your exams, you were all given the exam guidelines for life science. When you are studying, work with the exam guidelines. As you are studying, tick off. If you study to work, tick off on the exam guidelines. Please do not go into your final exams without looking at your exam guidelines. Right. Skills. Now that's the time. Skills are very important for paper one and two. So, let's look at important skills that you must know. Firstly, my second bullet, very important. For every task that you are going to get in your life science paper, please can I ask you, have a heading. You must have a heading in any task. If they give you a diagram, a table, make sure you have a heading. Now, an important skill is percentage increase and percentage decrease. Yes, I know you do maths, and I know you know your formulas better than life science. So, this is the easy formula. For percentage increase or decrease, you use the same formula. Difference over the first multiplied by 100. But when I talk about the first, the examiners are smart now. They know we picked up a pattern, so they're going to trick you. 
When we talk about first, this is the first number that's going to be in your word problem, first number in the table, first number in the graph. So maybe you should write that down as a little tip to always remember. But this is a very important formula. Many kids get confused between percentage difference and percentage increase and decrease. Immediately you see percentage and you want to give us the formula increase and decrease. The examiners know that. So read your questions carefully. I know stress can get the better of you. But that 10 minutes when you're reading, calm yourself down. These are easy marks to get. And also easy to make a lot of mistakes. So this I had to put in. This came out in our Gauteng prelim. And the kids were asked to draw a line graph. Now, there's a few mistakes here in this line graph that I would like to show you that you must never, ever make. Firstly, make sure that you take a half a page to draw a graph. Okay. The examiner must be able to see the graph clearly. Always start off your graph with a zero. Make sure that the number that you begin with, like this is five, you go up in multiples of five. Here, you can already see the mistake on the x-axis. Here, they start off with 14 and 18. They should have started off maybe with five and went up in multiples of five. So here, there's a mistake. Then, they tricked the kids. This was an easy prelim. And the kids were asked to write a heading. And the kids were asked to write to measure the fetal head circumference. And only from 14 to 40 weeks. Now, most of the kids, what they did is they listened to us from grade 10. And instead of writing the exact weeks, they wrote time. But you don't measure the fetal head circumference over time, over their whole lifetime. So they wanted, the examiners wanted exactly 14 to 40 weeks. So please, can I ask you, in this exam, you read your question carefully. That 14 to 40 weeks, that's when you're measuring the, the fetal head circumference. Not over time. And that's when the tricks come in. You read the questions carefully. It'll be easy to get an A, but now we don't want to get an A. We want 90%. So that's the difference with you reading properly and falling into the tricks. So also make sure with the graph. If the graph and the table does not start from zero, do not join the zero to the line graph. Please. That is something that we find the learners are doing a lot of. And then... We know you love maths, and we know you study more for maths. But we didn't ask you to draw a line of best fit. Okay, so let's leave your maths with your maths. You just stick to taking the normal plotting points and joining them together. Simple. Life science is simple. Life science is going to be the easiest A to get compared to maths. And I know you know your maths, so good for you. Let's look at scientific method, important skills. I cannot tell you how important it is for you to be able to identify the dependent and the independent variables. Now, a dependent variable is what you are measuring. You think and you ask yourself, am I measuring this? Independent variable, very easy, with an I. I control this variable. So it's easy to remember. But the one that not many kids know are fixed variables. Fixed variables are variables that if you do not keep the same in the experiment, will affect your whole experiment. So, most importantly, if you look at the notes, you have to begin with the word same. Once you master that, you should be fine. Now, we are scientists, so please try not to be vague in your answering. Don't just say same person. It could be different experiments, so don't say same person. Same person doing what? Same person taking you on an Uber drive, same person measuring your diameter of your pupil. You have to. There's the correct answer. The exam, um, one of the exam questions, they asked you to measure the size of the pupil or the diameter of the pupil. So your correct answer for a fixed variable is same person measuring the diameter of the pupil. Don't just say same pupil. pupil. If you're going to say same apparatus, same instrument, same instrument used to measure the pupil diameter. Be specific. Please, try not to, remember to write environmental conditions, same environmental conditions. That is too vague. And I've seen now for a long time that this is not accepted. So be specific. Now, again, yeah, what we've done is we've taught you a set of variables that you just regurgitate. But again, read the experiment. If I have taught you and if you've learned same person to measure the diameter of the pupil, 
look at the experiment and see if there is a need for the person to be, if you need a person to measure the experiment. So read the experiments carefully. Don't just regurgitate. So in certain cases, there are apparatus to measure the size of the pupil. You didn't need a person, but what did the kids do? They just wrote same person because we thought that. So read the experiment carefully. Now, so these are the skills. These are the fixed variables. Please make sure that you have the word same. I would advise you when it comes to plants or animals, use same species of plant. When it comes to plant experiments, same age of the plant. Then same person to measure the growth of the plant. I just didn't say same person. Same instrument, apparatus to measure the growth of the plant. So be specific. You are a scientist, so you have to be specific. Now, let's move on to calculations. You will definitely be getting calculations in your exam. So, you must include units in your answers. They are not giving marks for answers and units anymore. It's all or nothing. One mark for an answer and a unit. And just a little tip. If your answer, your raw answer is 40.56%, 40 40 if you're not sure what the examiner wants, leave your raw answer and round it off, as I've shown you, with your unit. And then, of course, your answer will be marked right because the examiner knows you know what you're talking about. You know how to round off. You've calculated correctly. Okay. Now, re reliability is a very important skill. It's asked in most of the exam papers. Now, the first question, they can ask you, how does a person ensure reliability? So these are just some of the tricks that could happen. Ensure reliability means it's just a general question. So you're going to say, increase the sample size. What I've noticed in the exams is they want you to be link the increase the sample size to the experiment. So you can say, increase the sample size by increasing the number of participants, the number of plants, test subjects, Relate the increase the sample size to the experiment. Repeat the investigation, of course. Yes, that's the normal. And a new one that I've just noticed that's coming out in many memos is take random samples. So this is how a person can ensure a reliability of an investigation. Then, I've also seen that they ask you, how has the person ensured reliability? Ensured is past tense meaning this is already done. You have to look at the text and pick out how the reliability of the investigation was ensured. So, if the text says the investigator used 100 piglets, yes, that's a large sample size. So then you say the investigator used 100 piglets. If the experiment was performed over 30 days, then yes, that's a long period of time. They repeated the experiment over a long period of time. So. When you're reading these questions, read carefully. Did they ask ensure reliability or ensured reliability? Okay. Now, please, the next things are the big mistakes that when we mark, we pick up a lot. So please know the following very well. Do not get confused. Right. Now, the first thing is, and I find that... Um, not to be sexist, but males get confused between corpus luteum because the males don't know the male menstrual cycle. So the men get confused between corpus callosum and corpus luteum. Don't worry, junior tuckies, males, you can prove me wrong. Okay, corpus luteum, luteum in the menstrual cycle. Corpus callosum, also in the brain, also larger in a female. Okay, so please, corpus luteum, corpus callosum, two different things. And if they ask you to label, please concentrate. Corpus callosum is in the brain. Corpus luteum is in the menstrual cycle. Then, chorion. Chorion, you're going to learn when we do, when you go over reproduction, invertebrates and human reproduction. It's an extra embryonic membrane, but the two sound very similar. So make sure you know the difference between a chorion and a choroid. Choroid is the middle layer in the eye. Now, umbilical artery and umbilical vein. I think the examiners know that most kids don't know this. So this will be asked in most papers. Umbilical artery carries deoxygenated blood away from the fetus. And it is the vein that carries oxygenated blood to the fetus. And many learners get confused here. Okay. Then, the cerebrum and the cerebellum also sounds very similar. So 
We will cover this later when we talk about the nervous system. Parasympathetic and sympathetic. Learners get confused here. Oval window and round window we will cover later. And then as well, glucose, glucagon and insulin. All sound the same and many kids get confused. But we will cover them later when we're dealing with the different sections. Right. Let's move down to content. Reproductive strategies. Reproductive strategies is eight marks. And I think some of you are thinking, now eight marks, let's leave it out. But also, it's also easy eight marks. Now, you must be able to distinguish between these terms. And these are some of the terms that come out a lot in the exam. And as you can see, I've included them in my notes so that you can also go over them, just to help you. So, ovipary, it's easy, with an O. Looks like an egg. So it's an egg-laying organism. But please, include in your answer that the egg is laid outside the female's body. Because sometimes in the memos, of course, they could ask you that. So I put the outside the female's body. Vivipari. Vivipari is an organism that gives birth to live young. Make sure you understand this. And then if you look at ovo vivipari, ovo vivipari, most kids can't even spell that properly. And they don't understand this. Now, I'm not going to say a female or a male because they are the male seahorse, which is actually over viviparous. So I just used in my definition an organism. Okay. So this is an organism that forms an egg inside the body. The egg hatches inside the body and then the organism gives birth to live young. If you look, you will see that it's a combination of ovipary and vivipary. So ovo vivipary is very important. Make sure that you know this definition well. Altricial and precocial. Do not go into that exam not knowing altricial and precocial. And altruism means to give of yourself to help somebody. So these are organisms that are not well developed. They're less advanced. Their eyes are closed. When it comes to birds, they don't have feathers. They're immobile and um, they dependent on their parents. That's why I say altruism. Their parents are giving of themselves to help the babies. Precocial is an organism, or it could refer to a bird that is independent, advanced, is mobile, can, has its eyes open, and has feathers. So please know the difference between the two. If you understand that altru altricial means altruism, it means to give off yourself, just remember the parent is helping the offspring. So please make sure you know these terms. Don't go into that exam not knowing these terms. And then I put in red, the amniotic egg. Make sure you know how to label the amniotic egg. You know the structures and the functions of the amniotic egg as well. All right. And that is for reproductive strategies. Those are your tips, your do's, and your don'ts. Now, human reproduction. 41 marks. And that could be an easy 41 marks. But here also, there's a lot of mistakes that could actually happen. Now. You have your exam guideline. If you don't have it, print it out. Have them for all your subjects as well as life science. You must memorize spermatogenesis and oogenesis from the exam guidelines. The exam guidelines were given to all the learners. And that means that most of the answers from the memo will come from the exam guidelines. So if you're doubting which textbook to use, I would suggest that you look at the content from the exam guidelines. So please make sure you learn, you memorize spermatogenesis, and oogenesis. Now, a little trick which could, which could come out in matching. Spermatogenesis, only meiosis takes place. And oogenesis, mitosis and meiosis takes place. And that's a little nice question to trick you in your matching, in your both A and B questions. Again, very important skill. Know how to draw the ovum and the sperm. Know how to draw, know how to label, know the adaptations of the ovum and the sperm. We've seen the sperm come out in many papers. We haven't seen the ovum yet, but it's, you still have another exam coming at the end of the year, so it might not be too late. So learn these diagrams, learn the adaptations, learn how to draw these gametes. Again, we don't use the word egg cell. The proper term that we accept is an ovum. So again, not egg cell, ovum. Male reproductive system. With the male reproductive system, I tell my kids this all the time, epididymis is definitely coming out because you can't spell. So definitely, they're going to put things in that you don't know very well, that you're going to easily get confused with. So epididymis, make sure you know where the epididymis is and you know how to spell epididymis. 
best case, sound out your words. Sound out your words. Also, do not be vague in your answering. I've told my kids that always statement and reason. The epididymis stores sperm. Okay, that's just a statement. Store sperm until mature, full answers. Like when you talk to your teacher, you don't say, sorry, ma'am, I'm late. Sorry, ma'am, I'm late, there was traffic. Statement and reason. Full answers to make sure that you get the full marks at the end of the year. Then, the testes is outside the man's body because sperm can only be produced at two degrees. Come on, don't leave it at two degrees. The testes is not at two degrees. Two degrees below body temperature. You have to compare it to something. So please, if you're not happy with this answer, then you say sperm can only be produced at 35 degrees Celsius. You don't want to say sperm can be produced. Say spermatogenesis can only take place at 35 degrees. Okay, so please make sure you know that with the testes. Then when it comes to the hormones, learn follicle stimulating hormone. I would advise you not to use abbreviations. Because when you're stressed, you make silly mistakes. Imagine if you write FHS. The examiner is not going to give you the mark. So at least in full words, you know your work is right. You can check. So follicle-stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone. Follicle-stimulating hormone stimulates the development of the follicle from a follicle to a primary follicle to a secondary follicle to a graphene follicle. And luteinizing hormone, most get confused. Lutein, luteinizing hormone causes the graphene follicle to swell and burst causes the ovum to be released, which is ovulation, and forms the corpus luteum. Remember, when there's high amounts of luteinizing hormone, that is when the woman is ovulating. Now, I've underlined estrogen and progesterone. There are many notes, many textbooks that don't give you all the information. But you need to know with estrogen that estrogen makes the endometrium lining thick, vascular, and glandular. That's just half an answer. For implantation. Always complete your answers. Now, if you look at progesterone, progesterone makes the endometrium lining more thicker, more vascular, more glandular for implantation. Now, please make sure you can distinguish between the two. And if you notice, my answers have statement, reason. Statement, reason to make sure you get your full marks. The negative feedback mechanism between progesterone and FSH. I cannot tell you how important this is. Don't go into your exam not knowing this. So, high amounts of progesterone. You have to have the word high amounts of progesterone. Inhibit FSH. Inhibits follicle stimulating hormone. And that will cause no follicles to form, no ovum will be released, no ovulation, no pregnancy. That is why most contraceptives will have progesterone. And some advice. If you don't know any answer, just write the negative feedback mechanism between progesterone and FSH. You should get some marks. And then the last thing, which I've seen in many papers, is embryonic development. Embryonic development. Know how to identify the stages. Know how to explain the development. So, I have even included it in the notes, so you can just memorize. The diploid zygote undergoes mitosis to form a ball of cells. B first. And that ball of cells is called the marula. That's easy to remember. B comes before H. This marula, it's called a marula because it looks like a mulberry. So this marula will undergo more mitosis to form the hollow ball of cells. That's what I'm saying. B, ball of cells, hollow ball of cells. And that hollow ball of cells is called the blastocyst. I'm not going to teach you all the other words. They only want to accept blastocyst to only learn blastocyst. Make sure you know the embryonic development. It is only the blastocyst stage that can implant in the endometrium lining. Notice again, I'm not saying uterus. I'm not saying uterus wall. I'm saying endometrium lining. And that is important. So these are some of my tips that I can give you for reproduction. Now, just a little tip. When it comes to questions, I think some of you don't even read the marks. You don't look at the marks. When you have that 10 minutes, look at the marks. If it's two marks, try to think of your best two sentences. Please, these markers, they work for a short time, a few days, and they have to mark many papers. Help them find your answers the first time. 
So, in the prelim, they asked, what will happen if there's no progesterone produced? What implications does it have for the pregnancy? And the learners were writing, progesterone maintains the endometrium lining, makes it more thicker, more vascular, more glandular. But, guys, you are bad storytellers. Get straight to the point. Progesterone will not be secreted, will not maintain the endometrium lining, will not make the endometrium lining more thicker, more vascular, more glandular. Hence, no implantation will take place. You need to get to the point. So, don't give us the whole story. We know you know progesterone. Get to the point. That's why life science is easy. Because they are now forcing you to select the best answers in your head. Don't write everything down. The marker is not going to mark and look for the correct answers. Most of the memo will say mark the first two, mark the first two. Long questions will have any six, any seven marks. But you can't bet on long questions to get your marks. So, reproduction, very important. Some tips, get straight to the point. Think before you write. I know you just think, oh, you see progesterone, you're going to regurgitate the answer. No. Think what they're asking you. Right. Right, let's move on. Oh, you're just thinking nervous system. Now you're getting nervous, eh? So I'll help you not to be nervous. The nervous system is 54 marks. 54 marks. If you're asking yourself which section to study first, my advice would be the ones you don't like the most, which is the eye and the ear. But listen to me. I will give you a few tips and a few ideas and what to learn, what not to study. Now, the nervous system. For too long, the kids have not been asked the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. In fact, some kids don't even know what the central nervous system is. That's the brain and the spinal cord. But peripheral nervous system, that's your cranial nerves, your spinal nerves, made up of your autonomic nervous system and your somatic nervous system. Make sure you know that. Those are good questions to ask you in your matching in your section A. And if you don't know this, that's also easy marks to lose. Now, I've noticed with the parasympathetic and sympathetic system, they love to ask you about heart rate. And I've seen in many papers, they ask about heart rate. So now, these systems, the parasympathetic and sympathetic system are antagonistic. So if you look, the sympathetic system is the one that increases your heart rate and your heartbeat. And the parasympathetic does the exact opposite, will decrease the heart rate or the heartbeat. Learn that, know that, have an idea that these systems are antagonistic. They work in opposite in relation to each other. And this common mistakes. I told you I was going to deal with this now in this section. Cerebrum and cerebellum. This is a mistake that too many kids make. The cerebrum controls your voluntary actions. So as I'm moving now, that is my cerebrum that is actually controlling the voluntary actions. But the fact that I'm standing upright and balanced, that is my cerebellum that is coordinating the voluntary actions. Now, please know the difference. Cerebrum, when you're talking about the eye and the ear, it is the cerebrum that interprets sight and sound. Cerebellum, very easy. Can you see it has the word bell? Balance. Bell, balance. So the cerebellum is responsible for balance. So the ear sends messages to the cerebellum for balance. Please don't make these mistakes. Reflex action. You're going to be asked what is a reflex action. And I usually teach my kids A. Automatic, involuntary. But you must have rapid response to a stimulus. Why do we have reflex actions? To protect the organism from harm. So if you touch a, the hot plate, that's a rapid response to a stimulus to protect you from getting burnt. Please make sure you know rapid response. I put the ticks there. Make sure you know this. The reflex actions are controlled by the spinal cord. Now, a reflex arc is the path the impulse takes from the receptor to the central nervous system and back to the effector. Please know the pathway. Our kids in the Gauteng prelim were asked to draw this. If they knew their pathway, they could draw this. It's very few things that they've asked them to question, question, and for the first time they were asked to draw. That was a very good question. And the girls that knew the content, the kids that knew the content, they did well. So we always start off with the receptor. The receptor carries this, uh, picks up the stimulus, converts the stimulus into an impulse, and the sensory neuron then will transmit impulses. Those are the only two words you should say, transmit impulses.
and then it goes to the dorsal root ganglion, enters the dorsal root, then interneuron, there's synaptic content, contact, then motor neuron, that's where the impulse will then leave the spinal cord, leave via the ventral root and go to the effector. Please know this. You might be asked the same diagram in your final exam as well. It was a very good diagram. So that is the nervous system. These are some of the tips. Please make sure you know the parts of the brain well. Know the spinal cord. Know the labels. Okay. Next, the eye. You're thinking, oh, do I have to learn this? It's the eye. You make sure for the eye and the ear, you learn the eye and the ear first. It's the most difficult. But I promise you, it's definitely come out in your exam. The mistakes I've seen is... Kids don't know the difference between ciliary muscles and circular muscles. Now, ciliary muscles are used in accommodation. And accommodation is the ability of the lens to change shape in near and distant vision. Ciliary muscles. Then, the circular muscles in the iris is responsible for pupillary mechanisms. These are the mistakes that we see all the time. And that is probably from stress. But I need you, that when you are writing this in your exam, look at these words again. Check your work. You should not be sleeping after an exam. Check your work. Check that you wrote circular muscles for the pupillary mechanism, ciliary muscle for accommodation. Then, please learn pupillary mechanism and accommodation. Know it well. My advice to you is to memorize this work. I have included from my junior Takis notes the pupillary mechanism, which is the ability of the pupil to change shape in, near, um, in bright light and dim light. And I've given you the answers with different pictures. It's good to look at and learn from pictures because that's how you're going to be tested. And then I've also included accommodation. Please make sure you learn this well. Okay. These are things that you must memorize. Don't go into the exam not knowing this. Okay. Let's move on to that dreaded ear. I don't think you like the ear very much. But again, the mistakes I've seen is the oval window. The oval window transmits vibrations to the inner ear. And then the round window. Many kids don't know this. The round window is a membrane that absorbs excess pressure from the sound. So if you're in an area where there's too much sound and the round window is abs cannot absorb all the excess pressure, you might have an echo in your ear or the sound could be distorted. Know that because in the matric exam they can ask you which structure prevents echo and distortion of sound and immediately you know, round window. Please don't get confused between the round window and the oval window. Learn these functions, memorize them well in advance so you don't get confused. Your station tube. Your station tube is a structure that comes out all the time. And they're going to ask you in a scenario based. Now, your station tube connects the um, outer ear and the middle ear, maintains the equal pressure on either side of the tympanum. And the tympanum or the tympanic membrane is the eardrum, which we're not allowed to use the word eardrum, tympanum or tympanic membrane. So they're going to ask you, what happens if you have skydiving? If you're skydiving, that pressure is so great and the velocity is so great that the eustachian tube doesn't have time to maintain equal pressure. And that's why there's unequal pressure on either side of the tympanum and that could cause the tympanum to burst. That's why skydivers will put earplugs. So this is how they could ask you the question. So make sure you know that the eustachian tube maintains equal pressure on either side of the tympanic membrane or tympanum. Know that very well. They will put you in a situation. I saw in the last year's paper, they didn't ask skydiving. They asked deep sea diving. It's the same thing. They're just different situations, similar answer. Now, balance is definitely coming out in your exam. Definitely. Most of us, we don't understand balance. It's fine. I've given you here a set of answers to memorize. Because I know that's the last thing that you want to learn. If you have a set answer, you should be covered. But let me explain to you. You could be asked this in a scenario again. They could tell you Rabada is playing a cricket match and he now dives to catch a cricket ball. What changes take place in his ear? So you must try to pretend you're diving for the ball. What's going to happen? Oh, that could be the crusty or the macula that works. Or oh, in our Gauteng prelim, they kept it simple for our kids. 
They just asked you, describe the changes that take place in the Christi to maintain balance. Wow, easy. So if they give you that, you see Christi, you must say Christi in the ampulla in the semicircular canals. Okay, changes and picks up, detects changes in speed and direction. And then you say, it's stimulated. The Christi is stimulated and an impulse is generated. You get a mark for stimulated and an impulse is generated. And then this impulse is transmitted via the vestibular branch. Branch, vestibular branch. I've seen so many of you have right nerve. Okay, vestibular branch of the auditory nerve. Many of my students wrote auditory canal. And that could have been one mark that they could have got if they just concentrated. Auditory nerve, please. And then it goes to the cerebellum. This is where we see the mistakes. Most kids write cerebrum. Here you have an answer. Please memorize it. If you're not sure, write both. And we pray that the examiner, the memo says any six. They'll mark all your work. If you're not sure whether it's the Christie, if they put you in a situation or the macula, write both. At least you will get some marks. Most of the time I've seen them asking the Christie a lot. And then, impulse is interpreted by the cerebrum and the message is sent via the motor neuron to the skeletal muscles to maintain balance. End of your answer with balance. So that's the Christie. The macula is the receptor that picks up changes in the position of the head in relation to gravity. So sometimes the Christie and the macula work together. It's very hard for the two to be distinguished. And it's very hard for them to work in isolation. So there's your first answer for the Christie. The Christie is the receptor that picks up changes in speed and direction. And here for the second one, the macula is the receptor that picks up changes in position in um, changes in the position of the head in relation to gravity. Now, let's look at our answer. Look at it, it's very similar. The macula is stimulated by changes in the position of the head. Macula converts the stimulus into an impulse. Always write stimulus into an impulse. Transmitted by the vestibular branch of the auditory nerve. And that message goes to, that impulse goes to the cerebellum to be interpreted. And then the cerebellum sends messages to the skeletal muscles to restore balance. My advice is, you're scared of the ear? Memorize this. You don't know what to write? Write both. I'm sure for the eye, there'll be a long question and your markers will give you those marks. But it's better than not being prepared. Ear is very difficult. But I hope I'm making it a bit easier for you so that you feel more confident that you can get these marks for balance. At least five marks, five marks. So that is the ear. Now let's move on. Ah, oh, endocrine system. It's the system that's going to produce a lot of adrenaline for you. So when you're writing your first exam paper, life science, on the 19th of November, then you know oh, my heart is beating fast, adrenaline endocrine system. It's not a very difficult section. Just a lot of work to study, which most of you just leave it and you say, okay, I know this work. Now, advice, position of the glands. Know the labels of the glands. Know the position of the glands in the human body. Then, when it comes to the endocrine system, the endocrine system, you must use the words more and less. If you're not using the word more and less, your answer is wrong. Okay, so please, my advice to you is when you're working with endocrine system, make sure you're using the word more and less. In fact, fit it in everywhere. If you're so unsure, more, more, less, less. That will make sure that's your answers. You'll know your answers are correct. Now, negative feedback mechanism between thyroid stimulating hormone and thyroxine. Again, I put TSH. Don't write thyroid stimulating hormone. I marked an exam one year. And the student wrote THS for stress. But I'm looking at the memo. So it had to be thyroid stimulating hormone. That's my advice. Rather write the full word. And then you're reading it and you'll pick up the words. Sometimes in abbreviations it's very easy to overlook a letter. Make sure you know the negative feedback mechanism between thyroid stimulating hormone and thyroxine. Don't go into the exam not knowing that. That will definitely come out. ADH, we know ADH stands for antidiuretic hormone. This one will come out because nobody is actually quite clued up with the ADH. The kids get confused. ADH is actually produced by the hypothalamus, but stored and secreted by the pituitary gland. 
and many people don't know that. Many kids don't know that. So it's easy to get confused. So make sure you know antidiuretic hormone. Hot day, cold day. Again, more, more, less, less. Aldosterone. Aldosterone controls the sodium levels. I've seen in many memos that they accept salt. I would advise you to write sodium, sodium and in brackets salt. You don't know what the examiner is going to accept. Aldosterone controls the amount of sodium in the blood. So make sure you know aldosterone as well. Insulin and glucagon. Do not go into that exam not knowing insulin and glucagon. And my advice here is insulin and glucagon. Insulin gets rid of not the glucose in your body. You need the glucose in your blood for cellular respiration. Insulin removes the excess glucose. And that's what the examiners look for, that you have the word excess glucose. So when you're studying, make sure you also study properly. So glucagon, we've been told many times to look at the spelling of glucagon. It's easy. Glucose is gone. So glucagon. So you say it in your head, glucose is gone. So glucagon will increase the blood glucose levels. Don't tell me sugar levels. That's too vague. That's a grade 10 answer. For grade 12, glucose levels. Insulin and glucagon control and regulate the blood glucose levels. So these are some of my tips. That's what you must know. Now, remember, thyroxin is responsible for your basal metabolic rate. It's scary to know that many kids don't know what a basal metabolic rate is. Metabolic rate is the rate of cellular respiration. Know that. That if there's a lot of thyroxin, your rate of cellular respiration is high, your glucose is broken down faster, that's why you lose weight. But I'm also a scientist, we can't lose weight, mass. So make sure you know that. The rate of cellular respiration, that's what metabolic rate is. That's what metabolism is. And then insulin converts excess glucose. Please, excess glucose to glycogen. And you learned in grade 10 that glycogen is your storage energy in your liver. I see the examiners want you. You must say liver. You must say liver. So if you don't have liver, add it in. Always add liver. And of course, we know that these hormones are secreted in the blood. But they, because you say hormones are secreted into the blood, they give you another mark. So add the word liver, that glycogen is stored in the liver, and the hormones are secreted in the blood. You have nothing to lose. And then we did say glucagon. Glucagon will increase the blood glucose level. Insulin will decrease the blood glucose level. Right. That's for endocrine system. So again, make sure more, more, less, less. If you're not going to write more, you're not getting more marks. If, you're not gonna, if you write less, you get less marks. Okay. Homeostasis. Well, homeostasis, you must know the definition for homeostasis to maintain a constant internal environment. This is a definition we've been drilling in your head from grade 10. Well, you don't, know, you don't remember what you did two weeks ago, so how can I remember, ask you to remember grade 10 work? That's why we teach you again, we revise again, to maintain a constant internal environment. Now, here I've just put hot day, cold day. Now, hot day and cold day, make sure that you know what happens on a hot day and a cold day? They're not going to tell you hot day. They can tell you a person has a fever. That's the same thing as a hot day. They'll put you in a certain situation. Cold day. The person is freezing, has hypothermia. Read the questions carefully. You know the work. It's just the questions are phrased differently. And when you think the questions are phrased differently, you get scared. You panic. But you know the work. So on a hot day, if you look at this, I took this out from the Mind the Gap. The Mind the Gap is a very good resource. Please make sure you're, you download. Guarantees you about a 60% in your final exam. If you're not getting the mind, the if you're not getting 60%, you have nothing to lose again. Okay? So, hot day. There's only two things that you were supposed to learn. And that was blood vessels and sweat glands. So, on a hot day, your blood vessels become more dilated. And that's vasodilation. And that means more Blood flows to the surface of the skin. More heat is lost by radiation. See, we're using the word more, more. The sweat glands will be activated more. Please, we also sweat. 
and secrete sweat when we have cold days. On a hot day, you secrete more sweat. On a cold day, less sweat. See the words more and less here as well. And then, obviously, more sweat is produced, more sweat evaporates, more cooling of the body. My advice to you with homeostasis, always start off with normal, end off with normal. So on a hot day, your body temperature is normal. On a hot day, it is the hypothalamus that is the center for temperature regulation. The hypothalamus will send a message to the blood vessels to dilate. So make sure you use the words hot day, with for hot day using more and more. For cold day, we're going to talk about that now. Cold day, it's still the hypothalamus that's stimulated. Cold day, less blood will flow to the surface of the skin. Less uh, heat will be lost by radiation. Less sweat is secreted. Less evaporation of the sweat. Again, yeah, we're using the words less, less, less. And you only have to talk about the blood vessels and the sweat glands. Nothing else. So I would advise you, please, make sure that you learn this work. Memorize this work. Now, in last year's uh, final exams, uh, in our Gauteng prelim, sorry, they asked about when a woman is going through menopause, her body temperature is high. See, they gave a situation. They just wonder, when your body temperature is high, of course, that's what happens when you're hot as well. So you just had to write the whole hot day situation, the answer. Many kids thinking, oh, we never do this before. I'm confused. It's a new way we're asking. Let's not write anything. So don't get confused. Read the question. Leave space. Come back to it when you're clear-minded. And then think, okay, and a pause, temperature is hot, hot day. Then you write your answer down. So, temperature regulation, very important. Hot day, cold day. Using the words more, more, less, less. So, that is now homeostasis. We still want to move on to something that comes out all the time. If you are writing an essay, this was going to be your essay. But now, you need to prepare that all those questions that were asked in your essay can be short questions. So don't now ignore essays. I would still practice an essay. In university, you're still going to need to write essays. Now, regulation of carbon dioxide. This comes out in every single paper. Please do not go into any exam not knowing this. Now, this is when your carbon dioxide levels are high. Now, this is when you're basically running. When you're running... When you're using a lot of energy, again, we're coming down to cellular respiration. You are producing more energy. You produce more energy, and what else is also produced? Carbon dioxide. And for the first time I saw, when we marked our Gauteng prelim, that they looked and asked, grade 11 work, and they asked, what happens when the carbon dioxide levels increase? Yes, it affects your pH. Remember that. Write that down. That was one of the marks that the kids had to have. So... You cannot have a lot of carbon dioxide in your blood because that's going to affect your blood pH. Your blood pH must be neutral. You learn this in grade 11. So, carbon dioxide levels increase. Please make sure you know that there are chemoreceptors in your carotid arteries and your aorta. These pick up the high amounts of carbon dioxide and send a message to the medulla oblongata. Again, kids write all the different words. Some of the kids write hypothalamus. Your answer is wrong. Make sure that you know that the breeding center is medulla oblongata. The medulla oblongata will then send a message to your breathing muscles, your diaphragm and your intercostal muscles to increase the rate and the depth of breathing. Rate means you're breathing faster. Depth means you're breathing deeper. Why? To take in more oxygen and very importantly, to get rid of the excess carbon dioxide. Say that in your answer, excess carbon dioxide. And by doing that, Obviously, your carbon dioxide levels will be returned back to normal. But that's not it. The medulla oblongata also sends a message to the heart to make the heart pump faster, to send oxygenated blood to the cells and to remove excess carbon dioxide. So, and this is how your levels of carbon dioxide is decreased in your blood. So, a very important question. I will not go into this exam without knowing this work. When it comes out, you can actually thank me. Next. Whew, the last section, the dreaded section. That from grade 10, you did not like plants. But plants are nice, easy, easy marks. Plants, and it's not just plants, not like the root and the stem and the leaf. This is plant hormones. 13 marks, easy 13 marks. So, 
There's a, I, uh, for my junior tuckies, I've made a set of mnemonics, easy mnemonics for you to learn, just so you'll be able to regurgitate and know your plant hormones. So you don't have to stress so much. So join, uh, log on to the junior tucky online platform, get the notes, do the questions. Now, yeah, apical dominance is very important. And some kids don't know what apical dominance is. So apical dominance is the shape of a tree. So why do most trees look like Christmas trees? A lot of lateral branches at the bottom, less lateral branches on the top. Now, lateral branches are branches that grow sideways. So that's apical dominance. There's an apical bud at the tip of the tree that when you cut that bud, the plant can't grow tall anymore. The plant will grow sideways. So it will grow more lateral branches. Make sure you understand that. That principle gets tested a lot. And then phototropism. Tropism is the when a plant of a plant goes towards or away from a stimulus. But photo means light, when the part of the plant will grow towards or away from light. Here I've included my answer from the junior tuckies. Make sure you know this. So this is now B. Plant B or should B is phototropic, is growing towards light. I've also included the answer. So remember, oxen is sensitive to light. So the oxen moves to the shady part. And because there's more oxen on the shady part, there'll be more growth, more cell division, cell elongation, growing and bending. Look at my answer. My answer is perfect for you to memorize and regurgitate into the question. But first, understand the question and know where to write the answer. The first one, many kids get confused. In the exam paper, they usually say that the tip is covered with foil, black um, covering or transparent covering. That means that that tip is exposed to equal light, light from all directions. And as you look at the picture, you will see that the oxen moves down evenly and the shoot will grow straight upwards. Make sure you know this. There's a lot of confusion in the kids. Make sure you know phototropism in B and know what happens when the plant shoot is exposed to light in all directions. Memorize this. It will come out. And then definitely geotropism. Geotropism is when a part of a plant grows towards or away from gravity. This is important. Do not go into that exam not knowing this also. But you're also confused. So when a plant is turned sideways, you, this is what's going to happen. The roots will always grow downwards and the stem will always grow upwards. And when you see the pot plant turn sideways, it's don't ever talk about phototropism. You say that is geotropism. Now, if they ask you what happens in the roots, I've cut out my answer from the junior tuckies. Memorize that. That's in red, what happens in the roots. When you, they ask you what happens in the stem, why the stem grows upwards, there's my answer. If you want to know more detail, I will be covering this in my plant hormone sections on junior tuckies, so you can join me there. There's just not much time to cover that. That's very important. And there I must teach you the diagram, explain the diagram as well. But Phototropism and geotropism are extremely important. Please make sure you know this. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have given you all the tips that I could. Please use these tips. Make sure that you work with your exam guidelines. Log on to the Junior Takis platform. We have a lot of notes, a lot of videos to assist you. And the matric work will be ready up soon. So you'll be ready for your final exam. You're not alone. I have given you enough tips. You should be confident. And the last thing that I have to do is to wish you all the best in your final exams, in your paper one. I trust that this has helped you. I wish you all the best and may you be blessed in your future. Thank you.